Last episode, we finished up the engine install, but then quickly managed to destroy the transmission. Now I'm not clear on exactly what failed, but something did. If nothing else, the TV valve has stuck, and it's time to rebuild this transmission. We'll get started pulling some things out of the way, and then pull that transmission out. Going off of what I read online, it's best to pull the transmission and transfer case together. It's a bit tricky because of where the torsion bar crossmember is, but you can push the whole assembly back and tilt the front down to get it out of there. I ordered a transmission jack for exactly this kind of maneuver, and I was very glad to have it. I considered a manual swap, but keeping the 700R4 seems like the best choice for me. To support the engine while the transmission is out, we use this specialty tool. Really fancy stuff we're working with here. Now that it's out, we'll pull off the transfer case and lug this thing up onto the workbench. I'm not going to go too into detail on this process, there are plenty of good guides out there, including ones I followed. There are a lot of pieces in a transmission like this, but all you're doing is taking it apart, looking for wear, replacing seals, and putting it all back together. If you take your time, be careful, and get a little creative with the tools you're using, it's suddenly a manageable job. I took lots of pictures as I went to make sure I could get everything back together as it came apart. As you'll hear from anyone who's taken one of these automatic transmissions apart, keep track of the check balls. This auxiliary valve body model of the 700R4 has eight removable check balls with two in capsules in the case. One of the check balls is larger than the others, and a lot of people recommend to leave this out when rebuilding the transmission. I'm doing this with bare minimum tools, and there are definitely some lessons I learned. If you'd like to see a more in-depth video of a rebuild like this, let me know in the comments, because I have a 4L60E that needs one. A lot of these parts will only go in one way, but you have to be very careful where all the thrust bearings and washers go. And finally, it's a part. With that said, the rebuild is only starting. I'm going to clean off the big parts with degreaser and a pressure washer, but I'm not going for sparkly clean here. First up, I went through the pump. It's a 10 vane rotor and everything looks fantastic. I cleaned up the pump halves, replaced the seals, and everything went right back together. And then I started on the input drum. This is where a lot of the magic happens inside of these transmissions, so there are quite a few steps to taking these apart. I found the input shaft to output shaft seal broken, which is apparently very common with the materials they used to use in 700R4s. Without a proper compressor, I got a little creative with a piece from a bearing kit and two screwdrivers. It did take a second set of hands to hold the screwdrivers down while removing the retaining ring, but it worked perfectly. The last things to come out of the input drum are the pistons. Installing the pistons with new seals is the single hardest part of rebuilding one of these transmissions. I used transparency paper, ATF, picks, feeler gauges, and a whole lot of swearing to get these things in. Just take your time and be very careful not to damage the new seals. It went back together with a screwdriver trick just as easy. Let the new friction soak in ATF and carefully lay out everything just as it came out. All you're doing is using new parts as you put it back together.
Next is the reverse input drum, which is handled in the exact same way. I'm swapping out the stock 2.4 servo with a Corvette style one. This is a very common and very cheap mod done to these transmissions. Next up is the valve body. This is commonly referred to as the brain of the transmission. There are quite a few valves and springs to keep track of here. Make sure they go back in exactly as they came out. It's impossible not to marvel at the engineering work that goes into one of these transmissions. An automatic transmission really is a computer. It just uses fluid and hydraulic principles instead of, or in addition to, electricity. You can follow these passages just as you can traces on a circuit board. With all the valves back in, the valve body can wait until final assembly. The only modification I'm making here is to install an anti-stick TV spring, which should help keep the throttle valve from sticking in the future. Installing the low reverse supply piston was one of the most difficult parts of this whole process. Once it's in, with the spring and retaining clip reinstalled, you can check it by applying compressed air to this passage. This part is what's known as the sun shell. Now, there was nothing wrong with mine, but I elected to replace it with a strengthened aftermarket one in order to prevent the most common failure in these transmissions. I went through and checked all the gears, all the sprags, and double checked the rebuilt assemblies before finally starting complete assembly. The case components are reassembled, and the torque converter lockup solenoid wires are reinstalled. Without a computer, there's nothing to lock up the torque converter right now, but I will install a solution for that at a later date. While the transfer case is out, I elected to replace the input shaft seal as fluid was leaking past it and into the transfer case. This is a common failure point. It took some struggling and some force, but I managed to get the seal out without any disassembly of the transfer case. I put on a new seal and finagled the transfer case back onto the transmission. With those bolts tightened, we have one last major component to reinstall. I ordered this remanufactured torque converter. It's lockup and was listed as a 1600 to 1800 RPM stall, so it should be similar or just a bit higher than the stall of the torque converter from the V6. While the transmission was out, I figured I'd take this chance to change the oil filter. It's actually not as bad as I'd expected, but it still kind of sucks to change. And with that, we're finally ready to reinstall the transmission. With everything hooked back up and a final check to make sure the throttle cable properly actuates the throttle valve, I can finally button it up and get ready for a test. Before we try to start this thing, as a quick side project, I ordered two new serpentine belt pulleys and a new alternator. I don't think I need to explain why, just listen. Just be careful with that tensioner or pulley bolt because it does have left hand threads.
Well, everything's installed. I hooked the pressure gauge back up to the transmission and filled it up with oil. Start it up right away. An initial look at the pressure in park and reverse looks great. But the engine starts cutting out. I figure the needles are stuck or something, so I take the top off the carburetor, run the fuel pump for a couple seconds, and everything seems fine. I check the floats, put it back together, and everything's fixed. So I'm just gonna chalk it up to it sitting for a couple months. After doing that, it runs like a champ again. And the pressures all look good. Everything reads just as it should. Time to put the exhaust back on, so at least if something breaks I can hear it. Look at that. I have never been so happy just to be able to drive backwards and forwards again. I topped off fluids, did another check of everything, reset the timing, and took it for a real drive. I didn't push it terribly hard, but I figured I should at least be thorough. So, it drives again. The initial setting of the TV cable seems right. It seems to be shifting just when it should. Unfortunately, that high RPM stumble is still there. I had to ask for help and put on my thinking cap for that one, but eventually I did figure it out. And it's a little bit crazy, but unsurprisingly, turned out to be my fault. The rebuild kit I used for this carburetor came with two types of needle valves the traditional style, and the off-road style, which is spring-loaded to help prevent flooding on rough terrain. When I set up the carburetor, I used the off-road needles and the specs from the off-road needle instruction manual on Edelbrock's website. When I looked into this, the older instruction manual for these off-road needles has a different float setting, and I came across more than a few people having problems setting their floats for these off-road needles. So I swapped back to the one-piece style of needle, set the floats for that, Put it all back together, and there we go. Mystery solved. That lean stumble is gone. The bowls were simply running out of fuel. With that fixed, I take the blazer for a couple long, spirited drives. It pulls well up to maybe 75 miles an hour. Past 75, it just doesn't really want to go anywhere. I figure the lockup torque converter would help that, but at the same time, I'm kind of afraid of how much blow-by there is. I wrapped a paper towel around the oil dipstick because with the oil even slightly overfilled, it did like to spit it out at high RPMs. I even tackled the hill that killed the transmission last time. No problems there this time. Until, after one of these drives, when I parked it and shut the engine off, I could hear bubbling. Pop the hood, and what do you know, there's bubbles traveling into the expansion tank. 
and not just a few. So I let the engine cool down and take off the radiator cap. As soon as the engine is started, a steady stream of bubbles. Now, this could mean a couple different things, but uh, I have a pretty good idea what it means. Now I have a compression tester, but not a leak down tester. So what I did was make one. It's a very straightforward setup, and I followed a guide online which has you make a damper with epoxy and a number 60 drill bit to help get a meaningful reading on the gauge. So all I did was take the valve out of the hose for the compression tester, hook up the new leak down tester to a cylinder at top dead center on the compression stroke, and apply 100 psi from the air compressor. The pressure reading on the gauge, as well as where the air is escaping from, can give you major hints to engine condition. Straight away, there is a significant amount of air coming out of the oil cap and the valve cover. This goes to show that the seal between the pistons and the cylinders is not good. But that does not explain the air in the radiator. Until I test cylinder number 7, at which point this test very quickly finds the problem. Yep, blown head gasket on cylinder number 7. So I should probably fix that, huh? A lesson I learned on this build, well I really should have just rebuilt this engine in the first place. My original plan was to prove that everything works, take the engine back out, and then rebuild it. After everything seemed to be working so well, I was hopeful I wouldn't have to do that. But well, now, since I broke it again, the engine has to come back out. This engine is going to need a full rebuild.